Praise the Lord. How you all doing? Doing good? Praise the Lord. We want to welcome those who are watching by Facebook. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed today's lesson. Did we get that guy to put up that slide, the first one? We're studying the interpreting the scriptures. For those of you who may be just joining us on Facebook, I don't know. Um, I want to welcome you, and uh, we thank God for you. I'm just moving all these papers out of the back so I don't get confused here. Got a lot of them. Well, did you all miss me Sunday? Yeah, you didn't know I was going away, did you? Some of you did because I mentioned it, but, but I guess some didn't trouble a little bit. Um, I was asked to speak at a mission uh, for a church. You know, Pastor Bob Layton, well, he took over the church in, in uh, Norwalk, Connecticut. And uh, at one time, they were given $30,000 a year in missions away. And uh, the pastor that they had, oh, I don't know where that came from, the pastor that they had recently cut out all missions. And so uh, he left, and when he left, Pastor Bob wanted to reinstate that, get that program back. So he asked me, he said, since you have a half a mission, why don't you come and open it up? And uh, I did, and I went and shared, and they were hoping to raise 7500 for the first year, and we ended up raising 12000 So praise God, that's, that's a real blessing. And uh, on that mission, support is Sajiv. And so that's going to be a real blessing. So praise God. All right, if you have your Bibles we're going to be, uh, and you have your books, we're going to be starting on Lesson 8 tonight on the Comparative Mention Principle. The Comparative Mention Principle. It's a little bit small, but I think you can probably see it if you've if you got good eyesight. If not, move a little closer. Uh, I promise you people will not bite you, except for Vicky. You stay back there. Vicky's got a little cold, you know, she's been fighting some laryngitis and stuff. And, and uh, before I forget, Nelson, I did bring that plant stuff for you. Okay, did you give it to him already? He put on his chair. Okay, good. All right, I did find it, so praise God. <clears throat> so first and foremost, we're going to ask the question, what is the comparative mentioned principle of biblical hermeneutics? And the compar comparative um, mentioned principle is... That principle by which a certain verse or group or verses may be interpreted by comparing or contrasting it with another verse or group of verses. And when you're studying the word, also remember that the interpreter must take into consideration other parallel script, uh, scriptural passages that shed light on that particular verse in question. Sometimes you'll get a, a, a verse of scripture that may uh, give one interpretation here but if you read it, another one similar to it in another place, it gives a, a, a little bit different uh, take on it. And we're going to be getting into some of those examples uh, later on. Um, uh, the two key words in this definition is uh, the um, comparing and contrasting. Don't ever take one scripture and blow up a whole doctrine out of it because you'll be in trouble. Um, and we're going to get into that also. Comparing involves examining other like passages, sometimes referred to as parallel passages. You'll see that very uh, parallel in a lot of the synoptic Gospels. When I say synoptic, I'm talking about Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You'll see uh, the same uh, story, but a little bit different slant to it. And so you have to look at all of that to get the full comparison. Otherwise, if you just read it and say Matthew... Um, it may say um, one thing, and then uh, Mark says a little bit something more and adds to that, and then uh, Luke says a little something more that's not in Mark, Matthew or Mark, and then you can take the whole story and the whole picture. It's like putting a puzzle together. So first and foremost, we'll be talking within the comparative principle is the idea of using the scriptures to interpret scriptures, and I've always said that to you. Always use scripture to interpret scripture. <clears throat> Don't use ideology of, your, of what you think it says, but know what the scripture itself says in comparison 
with other scriptures or in parallel to other scriptures. As the great Puritan Thomas Watson writer once wisely stated, nothing can uh, cut the diamond but the diamond. And he said, nothing can interpret scripture but scripture. Martin Luther also said scripture is its own expositor. And that is so true. Because what we endeavor to do is, and, and you know, I, I hope you really take this course to heart because uh, it's going to save you a lot of problems that can lie down, uh, go down going down the road of, of uh, being able to uh, fight off false doctrine. <clears throat> so many in the church, and I, and I mean this, so many in churches today are wrapped up in false doctrine and um, uh, learn to appreciate the solidity and the foundation that you have been has been laid in this church. Because uh, I've talked to some people and they said they heard something that didn't quite sound right to them. And they came to me and, and I, I said, that's good. You, you need to do that. You need to have that ability to discern when something's being said, even on television. I don't care if the greatest preacher in the world says it. You just make sure that you, uh, you, uh, you look at it and uh, examine it in, in accordance to God's word. Because God's not going to say one thing in the word and then one thing subjectively or on television to you and I. In the Westminster Confession, it states that the infallible rule of interpretation of Scripture is the Scripture itself, and therefore, when there is a question about the true and full sense of any Scripture, it must be searched and it must be known by other places that speak more clearly. In other words, if you have one particular Scripture and it says something that you're not really quite sure, and yet another portion of Scripture is identifying with the same subject matter of that scripture, you need to take the fullness of what it says. Uh, and so um, make sure you do that. And this principle directs the student to use scripture to help interpret itself. If a passage is difficult to understand, often there is another passage in the Bible that can be used to understanding the difficult or the obscure ones. So make sure that you do that. And the beauty of using, next please, the beauty of using the scripture to interpret scripture is that when the Bible answers its own question, then we know that the answer is correct. So always remember that, that when the beauty of using scripture to interpret scripture is that when the Bible answers its own questions, then we know the answer is correct. Uh, and we'll get into some examples in a moment. Uh, within the comparative principle is the idea of interpreting the unclear from the clear. You'd be surprised how many times false teaching comes out or false doctrine or, or standard of a church uh, dogma or teaching uh, is taken from one verse of scripture and it's inferred rather than interpreted. They, in other words, they infer, they say, well, because this principle, because this thing is not mentioned, therefore it doesn't mean this. And you can't do that. That's obscure. So let's look uh, at an example when... It comes to the early church and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Okay? And there are four places in the New Testament where people receive this experience. Acts 2, Acts 8, Acts 10, Acts 19. And in, the, in three of these instances, we see that those who received all, uh, uh, those that received this baptism all spoke in tongues. Because you get people that say, uh, you can be filled with the Spirit and not speak in tongues. And so... What's the answer? Okay, well, let's look at it. Okay, if you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and I'm going I'm to have you open your Bibles because I don't want him to switch from this. I don't want him to go to the Scripture. I want him to keep this slide up. So you're going to have to open your Bible. You're going to have to do a little bit of work today. Hallelujah. Right? Because how many come to Bible study and bring your Bibles? Amen. If you don't have a Bible, I can give you one. Anybody? Lose, you, did you leave your Bible home? Anybody leave their Bible home? Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Everybody there? I hear the rustling of pages stopping. That's good. Okay, well, the Bible says this in Acts 2, 4. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now, what's the, what's the context of that? Well, you know, they were all in the upper room, right, waiting for the, for the promise of the Father. 
And they were tarrying there until, until the promise of the Father came. And it says all of a sudden, like a mighty rushing wind, it came down and they all began to speak in tongues as the Spirit of God gave utterance, right? Okay. Well, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit also was upon Cornelius and his household. Look at Acts chapter 10. And we're going to go to verse 44 and 48. So let's go there to Acts chapter 10. Verses 44 to 48. It says, While Peter yet spoke these words, the Holy, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which, what? Heard the word. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Hallelujah. Then Peter answered, Can any man forbid water that these should be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord, then prayed they, uh, they him to tarry certain days. Now, that scripture is there to prove different doctrinal positions. Number one, baptism does not save you. These Christians were not baptized yet. They received the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. Which means they could not get that gift unless they were born again. Are you got it now? So if anyone comes to you and says, unless you're baptized in a certain way, in a certain formula, and you're not speaking in tongues, you're not saved. That's not true. Number one, they were not baptized. So that throws that whole uh, gamut out of, out of place. Okay? It says that they were, uh, they were then baptized in water, but they had already received the Holy Ghost and spoken tongues. The outpouring of the Holy Spirit was upon the men of Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Let's look in Acts 19 for a moment. We're going to get to the point in a moment. Acts chapter 19, verse 6. It says, And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. So, so far, the three scriptures that we read, right, all concluded that when they received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, they spoke in other tongues. Is that correct? Is that a correct interpretation? Okay. Now, in the fourth instance, it is not clear what supernatural sign was present, even though it is clear that something dramatic happened. And in this instance, it was the Samaritans who were baptized in the Holy Ghost. Look at Acts chapter 8, starting with uh, verse 14. Acts chapter 8, starting with verse 14. We all there? Okay. 8.14 Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through the laying on the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands on, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto them, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Let's see. Okay, I'll stop there. Now, people have read that scripture and said, see, it has nothing to say about them receiving tongues. This is they just received the Holy Ghost. Right? So a person can infer from that, and I say infer, but not pop properly, exegetically get the meaning of that. And say, see, people can be baptized in the Holy Ghost and not get tongues. That's erroneous.
However, one has to wonder what Simon saw. After Peter rebuked Simon for a wrong heart, he explained to Simon that he had neither part nor portion in this matter. The word that is used for matter here is the Greek word logos, which usually means utterance or speech. And by using the comparative mention principle, comparative, comparing Scripture with Scripture, right? You had three Scriptures that said that they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and they were speaking in tongues. Now you have one scripture saying that they were filled with the Holy Spirit without the mentioning of tongues. Right? So with that, you have to conclude that the thing that Simon saw was the same thing that was present in the other clear passages, and that is the evidence of speaking in tongues. And it's called actually the natural law of evidence which suggests the same conclusion. You cannot say because you read that one scripture, excuse me, that um, you can get the baptism of the Holy Spirit without speaking in tongues, simply by that one verse. You cannot do that because the clear evidence of comparing of the scriptures to interpret the scriptures, in all those other instances, they receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. And so it is inferred here, okay, that when they, he laid hands on them, what happened every time somebody laid hands on them? They received the Holy Ghost, they spoke in tongues. So the natural conclusion is to take that also for this scripture and not to input a, a, a meaning on that scripture simply because it's not there and, and argue from silence. Can't do that. So you see how I'm comparing the three to the one and saying, okay, it's the same. So within the, the comparative principle is the idea of two or three witnesses forming the basis for a doctrine. Okay? If you look at 2 Corinthians 13.1, we're, we're on C now. If you look at 2 Corinthians 13.1, Paul says, this is the third time I'm coming to you in the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. Okay? Got that? We indicated in the previous times that Mormons justify the baptism uh, for the dead from a verse in the New Testament. I'm going to give you another example. The Mormons teach baptism of the dead. Okay? And this is very interesting, by the way. I think I got a I got something here. Yeah. If you look at 1 Corinthians 15, 29, just keep your finger. You don't have to keep your finger in 2 Corinthians 13 because we already read it. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Okay? But in uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 29, it says, Else what shall they do which are baptized for the dead? If the dead rise, not at all. Are they then baptized for the dead? So somebody reading that would think that Roman Catholicism or even Mormonism, that you know how they baptize the dead with the water and they go around the casket and they sprinkle, that that's a legitimate teaching in the Bible. There have been numerous explanations on this verse. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in particular has claimed that this verse supports their view of baptism for the dead. But the Mormons are incorrect. They've taken this scripture out of context, and I'll show you how we can come to that conclusion. In verse 1 to 19, the fact of Christ's resurrection is detailed by Paul, right? If you go back and look at the context, beginning in verse 20 and going through verse 23, Paul speaks about the order of the resurrection. Christ was the first one raised in a glorified body, and next will be those who are at his return. Verse 24 to 29 then mentions Christ's reign and the abolition of death. This is when this controversial, controversial verse occurs. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead if the dead are not raised at all? Why then are they baptized for them? And just north of Corinth, in the city of Corinth, was a city named 
Eleusis, E-L-E-U-S-I-S. And this was the location of a pagan religion where baptism in the sea was practiced to guarantee a good afterlife. That's why you have to understand the culture, you have to understand the region, who they were speaking to, when they were speaking, what was the, what was the climate like, not the weather climate, hot or cold, but the climate, the atmosphere of that time. What was going on there? You need to know a little bit about the history. So that's why it's so important to not just take a scripture and read it. Try to learn a, a little bit about the culture and, and so forth. And it says, this religion was mentioned by uh, Homer and him to, De uh, De uh, I can't pronounce, Demeter in 478-79. In the Bible knowledge commentary, the Corinthians were known to be heavily influenced by other customs. Remember, Paul had a lot of problem with, with the Corinthian church. There was even one, one brother that was having his, his stepmother in sexual relations. So we also see that there was all kinds of gifts flowing, all kinds of things going on, and Paul had to come and bring order back into the church. So there was, there was some problems in the Corinthian church. And so here we see that, uh, after all, they were in a large economic area, and there was a great many different people that were frequenting it is probable that the Corinthians were being influenced by the religious practices found in that other city. Paul uses this example from the pagans in 1 Corinthians 15, 29, when he says, if the dead are not raised, then why are they baptized for the dead? Here's the key. Go look at verse 29. Else, what shall they do? Not us, not we. Come on now. He said, they baptize for the dead. What shall they do? They are baptized. It is the present passive indicative third person plural in the Greek. In other words, it is they are being baptized or they are baptized. And if you look at it, I is the first person singular, you is singular, second person singular, he, she, or it is third person singular, we, first person, plural. You, second person, plural. They, third person, pl plural. So he's saying here that they, what shall they do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead do not rise at all, why then are they baptized for the dead? He didn't say, why then are we baptized, including himself? Are you baptized, including them? So you see, just that one word gives the key to who was speaking there and what he was referring to. Isn't that neat? Huh? I think it's neat. I don't know about you. I like that stuff. Okay, next slide, please. No, I'm sorry. Go, to the, go, go back. Go back one more. I must have missed the slide. Oh, no, here we go. Okay. After Peter rebuked Simon for a wrong heart, he explained to Simon that he had neither part nor portion in that matter, right? We talked about that, right? Okay, did we go over that? Okay. The word that is used for, yeah, I go over that. I got to go over to, go back, go next, next one. Okay, yeah, I didn't finish this one. Is Paul indeed advocating that people who have died can be helped by a believer standing in, in for them and being baptized in their place? That's what was the, the, the ritual was. In other words, somebody that was not baptized, they would have somebody come, stand before them, okay, representing them, and they would be baptizing for the dead. That's what it meant. Okay? So he wasn't advocating that. If you look at it, the scripture, it says, this cannot be the case because there's only one witness or one verse for this teaching. You don't find this teaching anywhere else in Scripture. So remember what I read, read about? Paul said in, in Corinthians, I think it was 13 or 15, he says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let everything be established. Well, in the mouth of two or three witnesses in Scripture, let everything be established. No other place is it mentioned in the Bible, so you don't have the other two witnesses. So that's not the teaching that is, that is there. We have the command of Jesus in the gospel. We have the practice of the early church in the book of Acts and the theological understanding unfolded in the epistles. And if we apply this to the practice of communion and water baptism, it is easy to find 
the two or three witnesses. However, if we apply this to other things such as foot washing or baptism for the dead, we will not find our witness. Go to the next chart. You'll see what I'm talking about. If you look at water baptism, I'm going to take a drink for a minute. If you look at water baptism, right, you have the threefold witness. You have Matthew, it's practiced in Acts, it's unfolded in Colossians. Communion, you have Luke, Acts, Corinthians. Foot washing. Okay? Some people say you should have foot washing in your, in your church. And if you don't have foot washing in church, you're not, you're not doing what the church says. No. It's got to be in two or three witnesses. You have it in John, and they did it for a reason in the culture that they did it. Okay? It doesn't nullify that they did it, but it's not a command for you and I to do it. So if you look here, it, John, it's there, but pra it's not practiced. None. It's unfolded. None. Baptism for the dead, there's, there's no command for it. It was practiced and mentioned only, but there's no unfolding of it. This cannot be the, ca the case because it contradicts other clear doctrines of the Bible. The Bible says, first, is when you die after this, what? Judgment. So there's no purgatory, there's no uh, lighting candles and paying money to get you out of purgatory once you're there in the grave and you're dead. You're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. <clears throat> and now people come, people come along and say, well, I can't believe a loving God is going to send anybody to hell. And I say, no, God don't send anybody to hell. You do. It's your choice. God has made a way of escape for you, and he's given you a savior to save you, and his name is Jesus Christ. And if you refuse, that's on you. That's not on God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son to save you and forgive you of your sins. And if you don't want it and you refuse it, don't blame God. Amen. And the Bible says that in Hebrews 9, 27, the scripture teaches that death is final. As it is appointed for men once to, to die once, after this the judgment. That's it. The scripture teaches that there is no second chances after death. Scripture teaches that our eternal destiny is determined on the basis of what we do in and with this life that Christ has given us. Scripture teaches that heaven and hell are eternal states. And this cannot be the case because a careful reading of the passage will show that Paul is not talking about his own practice or the practice of other people. In several passages of Scripture, it is important to follow Paul's train of thought and determine about whom he is indeed talking. Uh, let's see if I should read that. One pa such passage is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. You can turn there. 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 11, a passage that has often been put forth to support a pre-tribulation rapture. It is important to watch the pronouns in this passage, otherwise it seems that Paul contradicts himself in this short passage. But concerning... The times and seasons, brother, you have no need that I should write to you, for you yourselves perfectly know that the day of the Lord so, so comes as a thief in the night, for when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should not overtake you as a thief. You are all are the sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober, for those who sleep, sleep at night. Next next. Slide, please. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting the breastplate of faith and love as a helmet of hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that we wake or sleep, we should live together with the Lord. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you are doing. In this passage, Paul distinguishes between two end time scenarios. One of them has to do with them, and one of them has to do with us. They are going to be saying peace and safety. They are spiritually asleep. They will experience sudden unexpected destruction, and they will not escape. However, we are children of the light. The day will not overtake us as a thief, and we, will, we are not appointed to wrath. So does this apply to baptism for the dead? When you read this passage with the context, Paul's continued line of argument that he has begun in verse 12, where he mentions that some suggest that there is no resurrection of the dead. 
There were pagan religions of the day who taught such things as well as some Christian heretical movements such as Monarchianism. Some of the people in Corinth had difficulty at times separating them from religious beliefs and may have carried over some of these into the new Christian experience. Now, <clears throat> there's a difference between the second coming and the rapture. Okay? Because there are other scriptures in the Bible that talk about the rapture of the church, and you have to be careful when you're reading things. Just as I was um, uh, discussing with somebody, and we, we talked about this in the Bible, in Romans chapter 7, even though the Apostle Paul uses present tense, and he uses uh, the singular, I, me, my, you know, when he's talking about himself, when he says, uh, the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things that I hate, those are the things I do, those, those scriptures. But he's speaking that in the present tense, in, in the singular, but you have, to, uh, you have to clarify that with verse 1. Who's he talking to? He's talking to the Jews. And in, I think it's in Galatians he says, to the Jew I became a Jew. Well, when did he, how could he become a Jew? He was already a Jew. So when did he become a Jew? He became a Jew as under the law. He says, and to those that are under the law, as under the law. When did he, be, when did he come as under the law? When in Romans chapter 7, he's describing himself. He's not describing his present state saying that he is a Christian. He couldn't obey God. That's not what he's saying because it would contradict Romans chapter 6 where he says sin will not have dominion over you. When you are to walk in newness of life, it would totally contradict what he's saying. So you have to pre-qualify that with verse 1. I'm speaking to those who know the law. And he's putting himself under the law even though he's speaking in the, in the, in the singular of I, me, and more. So you've got to be careful of some of that stuff too that goes around. Amen? Okay, let's go to the next one, uh, section two. What is an example? What is the example of comparing verses of Scripture? As we indicated, go to the next one. As we indicated before, comparing involves examining other like passages, sometimes referred to as parallel passages, to find additional light relating to your passage. <clears throat> Look at the, the brazen serpent. It was made by Moses for the healing of the Israelites. Numbers 21.9. Let's look at that. Numbers 21.9. It's in the Old Testament. Numbers 21.9. 21. It's the fourth. My pages are sticking. Numbers 21, verse 9. And Moses made a serpent of brass and put it upon a pole, and it came to pass that if the serpent had bitten any man, when he looked or beheld the serpent of brass, he lived. Now, I'm going to show you okay, how this scripture has been misinterpreted. In a lot of the faith movement that's out there, the Kenneth Copeland, Kenneth Hagin, Jesse Duplantis, um, Marilyn Hickey, Joyce Myers, all of these people teach that Jesus had to be born again. Now, you won't hear that on TV, but if you buy their material, you buy their tapes, and listen to them, They'll, they'll very clearly show you that. They said that Jesus had to be born again and that he became satanic on the cross because he took on the sinful nature. He became sin. That's what they say. He became sin. And so therefore, he became de demonic. And they take this scripture about, Satan, uh, about the serpent being on a pole and saying, see, the pole was the cross. This is symbolic of that. And Jesus became satanic on the cross. This is what they teach. If you read their material and you look up their material, okay, and I can give you where to, where to find that, you look that material up, it's because of scriptures like this that they infer the meaning into it and they don't take the meaning out of it. Later on in time, in 2 Kings 18, 3-4, to, uh, to it was later worshipped by the Israelites and became idolatry. I'll read it to you. 
And he did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places, broke the sacred pillars, cut down the wooden images, broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days the children of Israel burned incense to it and called it Nehushtan. What God used for, for something, they, they messed up. They started worshiping that thing. <clears throat> Now, in the New Testament, it became, it became a symbol of Christ. In John 3, verses 14 and 15, it says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So he does a comparison. And he says, see, I'm going to show you a comparison. In the New Testament, it became a symbol of Christ on the cross, and if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all peoples to myself. This, he said, signifying what death he should die. Now, was Jesus a serpent on the cross? No. What was the serpent representative of? The enemy. Right? It's symbolizing that through the cross, Right? The Bible says, for this purpose was the Son of God manifest, that he might destroy the works of the evil one. When Jesus suffered on that cross and died and said, it is finished, he defeated the work of Satan and showed Satan to be powerless to those whom Christ had given authority over. If you realize that you have power over demons, over scorpions, over serpents, and over all the power of the enemy, why do you have that power? Because your old man was crucified on the cross with Christ. And because of that, Satan doesn't have authority over you. You are a new creation. Hallelujah. So that, that serpent on that cross showed... Judgment to the serpent. Judgment. He's judged. He's, he's defeated. In the same way with Christ, he says, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto myself. So he's using it as a comparison, not as identifying it. What is an example of contrasting verses of Scripture? As we indicated before, contrasting involves examining. Are we on the next one? Okay. He's examining other passages would deal with the same subject but with an oppos opposing view viewpoint. And here's two examples. The tree of faith. Okay. In Jeremiah 17, 5, 6, you don't have to look at it. It says, Thus says the Lord, Cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength, whose heart departs from the Lord. For he shall be like a shrub in the desert. Now you know that's not literal. Right? What is he inferring here? Huh? No fruit dried up? Huh? Trusting in himself? Right? He's dried up. He's like a shrub in a desert. What's, it, what's in a desert? What lives in a desert? There's no water. Dried up. Unfruitful. Like a shrub. And shall not see when good comes. Everything's a problem. Don't see on the other side. It's always, woe is me. You can tell people that live in deserts. I tell people all the time, if you want to live in the desert, live in the desert, but I'm not going there. I got to live in water. God gave me a promise. It's right there on the back wall. So if I'll pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. Let me tell you, a, thirst, a person that's stuck in the desert, he may be thirsty, but he's not satisfied. A person that's in the desert is never satisfied. 
Always want more. I desire more. Shall not see when good comes, but shall inhabit the parched places in the wilderness. Hot, dry, dead. Can I tell you, there's a lot of Christians like that. They're dead. They have no life. They never read the Bible you, unless you probe them. They never pick up the word. Everything else comes first. Is the satisfying of their flesh comes first before anything else. Come on, somebody. It says, inhabit the parched places in the wilderness in a salt land which is not inhabited. They're lonely. No one wants to go where they are. Now watch this. Jeremiah 17, verse 7 and 8. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord. Here's a comparison. Whose hope is in the Lord. For he shall be what? Like a tree planted by the waters. Hallelujah. What does a tree do by the water? Which spreads out its roots by the river. The roots are spread out. And what the roots do? They go like this. They just suck that water in. They're constantly sucking that water in. Hallelujah. Constantly sucking that water in. That's, that's why we're talking about comparison here. And will not fear when heat comes. But its leaves will be green and will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor will cease from yielding fruit. Even when they go through a drought. You know why? Because they set up a reservoir. They kept drawing. They keep drawing. In the same way you and I, we keep drawing. We keep drawing from the river that never shall run dry, somebody. Hallelujah. You just keep drawing from that river. You won't be a dried up, patched up Christian, a tumbleweed Christian. You won't be, like it says there, uh, uh, you know, uh, a shrub in the desert. If you change your attitude, you'll change your altitude. Let's do a comparison. Next, next slide. Let's do a comparison with Psalm 1. Psalm 1, verse 1 to 3 says this. Blessed, say it with me, blessed, is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. When you need counsel, why are you going to the ungodly? Why are you going to uh, Wikipedia? Why are you going to the internet for your answer? Hello? Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners. Don't be listening to them. What do you think I should do? You should be asking. Ask a Christian, somebody you know, somebody you trust. Talk to them. Ask them, how did this, did this ever happen in your life? What did God do for you? How, how did he answer that prayer? Get some wisdom. You know, the Bible says, all we like sheep have gone astray. You know, sheep are dumb. Sheep are dumb. A sheep, will, not knowing how deep the water is, will cross a river, and with all that wool, will sink right to the bottom and drown. Yes. Amen. But look at it. Let's read the rest of this now. He doesn't stand in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. Are you hanging around people that will scorn and ridicule your religion, or what, your faith in Christ?
We're not to do that. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he does meditate day and night. What's the excuse we hear most of the time from Christians? I didn't have time to read today. I didn't have time. I don't have time. I just ain't got time. Got time for everything else. Come on. Well, look what it says. And in his law, does he meditate day and night? And if you do that, if you do that, you delight, you delight, you delight. Is reading. Some people don't read the Bible because they don't have no delight in the Bible. But it says if you delight, delight, come on now. In the law of the Lord. And in his law you do meditate day and night. He said, well, you'll be like what? You'll be like what? A tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit. You, I think you said this Monday night too. I think it was you. In his season. In other words, you know what? You're going to reproduce in the right time. Okay. Right, as long as the desires line up with his word. Right, as long as it lines up with his word. He'll give it to you. Amen. He says, He'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in a season, whose leaf also shall not wither. And whatsoever he does shall what? Okay, let's read the, the other side of that. The ungodly are not so. But are like the chaff which the wind drives away. In other words, they're blown all over the place. They're chasing everything that they want to chase. Success. Money. Things. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. Oh, but we got the seeker friendly churches now. We want them coming into the church. We don't care if they stay in their sin, we don't care if they're unconverted. We, we don't care about that. I'll, I'll, if you've got a question, just write it down. We'll talk about it in a, in a minute. But, but, no. See, God in his mercy has allowed that to happen. People getting saved in the church. That's wonderful. God didn't, God didn't say, Jesus didn't say, go out into all the church and preach the gospel. He didn't say that. When he says to compel them to come in, he didn't talk, talk, he's not talking about the church. He's talking about compelling them to come into Christ. But he says, look, therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment of sinners in the congregation of the righteous, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What is that scripture saying? You have a choice. You have a choice. And it's going to happen. Now, another example of comparison and contrast, you'll find it with two builders in Matthew chapter 7, verse 24 to 27. Let's examine these two accounts that Jesus' story gives on these two different occasions. You can see the similarities, and you'll see the differences, okay? <clears throat> Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. Now, ask yourself, do I want to be wise or do I want to be stupid? What would you like to be? Wise or stupid? Pick one. Everybody says wise. Okay. Well, we want to be wise, but we want to be wise 
without effort. But there's effort, there's effort involved in being wise. Okay. Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I'll liken him to a wise man. So here you see, God looks at a person who is wise, who first and foremost hears these sayings of mine and does them. Not just the hearers. You come to church and you hear. You're not, you, and when a time of wisdom, when you want wisdom, if, if you're just a hearer, not a doer of the word, and you get into trouble, and you cry out to God for wisdom, you know what the Bible says in, in Proverbs? Wisdom will laugh at you. And will laugh at your calamity in the time of trouble. Why? Because you rejected wisdom. He says, if you reject it, he'll reject you. Read it. I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these things of mine and does not do them comes to church Monday, Wednesday, Sunday morning, doesn't do them, doesn't do the word, just a hearer. What does it say? We'll be like a foolish man. Foolish. Foolish. We're doing a comparison here. Watch. I don't want to preach, but I, I could. Who built his house on the sand, and the rain descended, floods came, winds blew, beat on that house, and it fell, and it was great was its fall. Let's look at it in Luke. <coughs> Excuse me. Chapter 6, verse 46, 49. But why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? Whoever comes to me and hears my sayings and does them, I'll show you whom he is like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep. That's why you're going to read them both. Matthew doesn't talk about digging deep. But Luke does. He says, it's like a man who, who, who hears and my sayings and does them. I'll show you he is like, he is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid the foundation on the rock. And when the flood arose, the streams beat vehemently against the house. It could not shake it, for it was founded on the rock. But he who heard and did nothing is like a man who built a house on the earth without a foundation against which the stream beat vehemently and immediately it fell. And the ruin of that house was great. Okay, these passages contain many similarities. First, both passages point out the same characteristics of the wise and the foolish man. Both passages refer to the floods. Both passages end up with the house of the wise man standing and the house of the foolish man being destroyed. Next scripture. Uh, next uh, and then there are passages that contain notable differences. Look at the differences. Matthew, no mention of digging. Luke, the wise built it, dug deep. Matthew says rain, flood, and winds. Luke says flood and the stream. Matthew says the foolish man built on sand. Luke says the foolish man built on the earth. No specific mention of foundation in Matthew, but the foolish man built without a foundation. That's why you need to read both. Get a fuller picture, parallel together. No mention in Matthew of the intensity of the storm. Luke says the stream, the stream beat vehemently. Wow. That was an intense storm. Ever been in an intense storm? Lightning and thunder? That lightning crack, man, you, you scared as anything. Scared my wife one time, and we were in Baton Rouge. She was sitting in the garage. And lightning bolt came down and hit that, and you know, crack, bang! She 
come running in the house. The more we can compare Scripture with Scripture, the more likely we are to render an accurate interpretation of verses and themes of the Scriptures. Amen? I'll give you one more example and I'll close. In Matthew 28, verses 2 to 7, and you can go there. You can use, you can use these scriptures because I'm done with the uh, slides. Is this helping anybody? Matthew 28, verse 2 to 7. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for the fear of him, the keepers did shake and became as dead men. All the way to, we're going to go all the way to verse 7. Next verse. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, Fear not, I know that you seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he has risen from the dead. Behold, he goeth before you in Galilee. They shall you see him, lo, I have told you. Okay, read. Um, let's go to Mark 16, verses 5 to 7. And entering into the sepulchre, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed with a long white garment, and they were afraid. And he saith to them, be not afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He's risen. He is not here. Behold the place where he laid him. But go your way. Tell his disciples, Peter, that he goeth before you into Galilee. There shall you see him, and he sa as he had said unto you. Okay. Do you see the similarity? It's our man. It's our another man. In that scripture, you're inferring that he saw one person. Right? An angel. Okay. Go to Luke 24, verse 4 to 7. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Oh, wait a minute. Stop. Hold the phone. The other two scriptures we read was only one man. Now, Luke is saying there's two men. Go to the next verse. I'm going to go to 4 to 7 also. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke unto you when you were in Galilee? saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man and be crucified on the third day rise again? Okay, now go to John 20, 12. And see it, two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had laid. How do, you, how do you coincide this? Two passages of Scripture say there was one. Two passages of Scripture say there's two. How do you, rec how do you reconcile that? Do you have an answer? Huh? Yeah, but the other passage just said there was one. And the angel, he said unto them. So, see, this is where the skeptics say, see, there's a contradiction in the Bible. Let me give you an example. You're driving down the street. Okay. 
and you see a person get hit by a car. You get out, you start to minister, you start to help that person medically. The husband and wife get out of the car that hit the person and are standing beside you. A witness comes over to the scene and sees you. Okay? Says to the wife, let's go. Get, I'll go, we'll go call the police. We'll go call the ambulance. They two run off. Another car comes and sees the accident, stops, comes to help. Only the husband's there and you're helping there. Right? And he sees that and he goes and calls the police. So when the police interview him and says, when you rolled up on the accident, how many people were there? It was the husband and the person helping. Right? Is he right? Okay. When they interview the woman that stopped and took the woman to go call the police, and they say, how many people did you see at the scene? She said, I saw the husband and the wife and the person helping. Is that a contradiction? No. One person just showed up a little bit later than the other. So it doesn't contradict anything. If one, if math, let's, let's say for an example, if just Matthew and Mark just wrote about one, even though there was two and just said an angel, are they right? And then and Luke and, um, and uh, John, they saw two, and they wrote about two. Does that mean that they were right? Yes. So there's no contradiction. Okay, it just enhances everything. Amen? Praise God. Any questions? It, well, actually, it just depends. It just depends on what the person wrote. It's their eyewitness account. So if you only write about one angel, okay, because... Uh, your mom came in and said, cook me supper, and you left off writing, and then you, didn't, you cooked her supper and went back and didn't mention the other angel. doesn't mean that you're wrong. Right? And I'm trying to give you scenarios here so that you can look. Yes. Did you? Exactly. The main point of the whole context of that scripture was that he is not here. He's risen from the dead. And people lose sight of that, getting caught up in one angel, two angels, this here, that there. That doesn't make any difference. And it doesn't contradict what was written. So you'll find that in the scriptures. So don't get so caught up in that stuff. There's always an explanation. God never contradicts his word. Yes. There you go. Sister Lucy, you had something you wanted to say? Exactly. Uh, if you didn't hear what she said, she said she was telling somebody on the phone, somebody was telling her about something, and she said, well, that's not what the Bible says. She said, well, that's what the man of God said. And so, first of all, the man of God has to be subjective to the Bible. He's got to be subject to the Bible, not the Bible to him. And so, again, if someone comes to you and says something like that, um, you know, and the pastor says to do this, and it's not scriptural, don't do it, you know. Really? Right. Right. Somebody told you you're a hypocrite. Well, how can you be a hypocrite? You're not doing what he does. 
See, people don't know the meaning of things that they speak, what they say. Okay, they just spurt things.